Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Another day. Another day. We have been telling people a lot to just see these ideas of systems thinking all around them, look for distinctions, part whole systems, see relationships, take different perspectives. But I have a little challenge for you today. Oh. We are probably hear a lot of things that actually are very related to the things we're talking about, but maybe people don't make the connection. So, for example, things like sayings we hear, like forest for the trees. You want to talk about forest for the trees? I want to talk about like funny little sayings that we all hear every day that are little windows into actually when we're making a distinction or when we're seeing a part whole system. Oh. Come on, that's fun. Yeah. That's a fun like thing. Like popular to sayings, sayings yeah. that are systemy in systems thinking or yeah. that type of thing. Okay, and the one and you Cuz you start said with... to me yesterday, see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Or Yeah, that's a pretty popular one. I was like, well, what the hell does that mean? But then I thought about it and I thought yeah. I get you on camera and make you explain it. Yeah, so see the forest for the trees is really part whole, right? The S in DSRP. It, it's about, really, people should say see the forest and the trees because we don't want to see the forest or the trees. Uh, we don't want to see just the trees. We don't want to see just the forest. We want to see both. And by the way, the tree is its own form of forest because it's a whole ecological system in and of itself every tree um so it's like a forest so the the part is a whole yeah and the whole is part of a larger whole the forest is part of a larger forest and or a larger ecosystem and so see the forest for the trees is really just trying to get encourage people to zoom in and zoom out that's one of the moves that we've talked about a lot on the podcast uh-huh. To zoom in and zoom out. Zoom in, see the trees, zoom out, see the forest, but then zoom out and see the, the you know, the national park that the forest is a part of and the ecology that it's a part of and zoom into the tree and see that, wow, there's there's whole, you know, just the bark alone is a whole ecosystem at a micro uh-huh. level. Uh-huh. So seeing the forest for the trees just kind of is a, a euphemism for part whole, zoom in, zoom out. It is, but also as you were explaining it, what's what's cool is it's not just a euphemism for that. It also reminds you that anything that you see as a whole can have parts, Mm -hmm. and anything that is a whole is also a part of a bigger whole. So like forest trees, like you're saying national park. And anything that's a part is a whole that has lesser parts. Yes. And, you know, one of the things, if you go down into the jungle or something like that, you realize that these, you know, you get these huge trees that go all the way up into the canopy. And you realize this tree itself is a whole ecosystem, right? And every tree is like that. Every tree is a little mini ecosystem. Um, and, you know, so you, you start to see when you when you think in these terms, this zoom in, zoom out, part whole structure systems terms, the S and DSRP, mm-hmm. you start to see like, you know, you could take one little square inch of your skin and if you zoomed in on that, you would see that there's a whole ecosystem living right there yeah. on that skin with microclimate and literally with yeah. microclimate, there is yeah. microclimate at the, at the surface of your skin. And if you zoomed in on that, you would, um, you would you would see this ec- ecological system, forest and trees. Huh. In fact, I, we used to um, play a game that was actually, I got it from Richard Feynman. Oh, yeah. Um, that uh, was a great, great physicist. He, we used to play the game with his kids. With, he, he played this game with his kids, and yeah. I, we played it with our kids. I remember. Where you got them to imagine... So you tell them, oh, you know, there's this cave and there's this, you know, cold wind coming in and then warm air going out. It was usually a bedtime. Yeah, yeah. And um, the kids would be trying to figure out what it is. And then they'd realize, oh, it's the, you know, it's the dog's mouth. Oh, yeah. I remember you right? said, like, stalag- stalagmites or stalactites. Yeah, yeah stalactites or stalagmites. Oh, I guess it's both. In that yeah, case, if they're yeah. going down or up. And, and uh, so we'd talk about like the shag carpet or, you know, and it was mm-hmm. like this this forest of 
trees that were bendy yeah. and purple or something like that, right? And, Wacky uh, things our kids will remember. <laughs> yeah, and the kids would figure out, you know, before bedtime, they'd figure out, like, what is it? What's he talking about in the room kind of mm -hmm. thing? That's right. That's just training young people and any age, really, training yourself to, to sort of see at a different scale than the one that you're at. Well, and then you take things like look at the big picture. Well, that's yeah. telling us to zoom. Zoom out. And then you've got things like, um, oh, devils in the details. That's a popular one. Yeah, that's kind of about like you didn't zoom in enough, right? Mm -hmm. The devil is in the details. That means you didn't zoom in enough, right? And so that's zoom in, zoom out. Um, and, you know, that sounds like really simple, but like, like we've said before in our research, people don't do it, right? right? Very few people zoom in and even less people zoom out. And it's really critically important, in fact, in science, there's these two things called holism and reductionism, mm -hmm. which pretty much characterize the whole gambit of all of the sciences, you know, yeah. uh, that people are kind of being reductionistic or splitting, you know, so we call them splitters. There's, okay. Sometimes we say that in science, like there's really just two kinds of scientists. There's splitters. Those are the reductionists who are breaking things down, breaking those things down, breaking those things down. Yeah. And then the holists who are lumpers, yeah. you know, that are lumping stuff together, lumping stuff bigger together, bigger, going bigger, bigger and yeah. bigger. And what I've always said is we need a kind of a new kind of mind mm -hmm. for the new science, which I call a splumper, a splumper. which is a, a lumper and a splitter, like somebody that can term. do both. <laughs> it's an and both person. So for... You know, hundreds of years we've been arguing as scientists, should it be holism or should it be reductionism? And, you know, it's kind of a false, it's a false choice. It, yeah. It's and, and both, the um, the genius of the and, both, yeah. rather than the sort of tyranny of either or. That's right. So That's these, right. The, these quotes, these euphemisms are just ways to get us to remember that these are, although seemingly simple, part whole. Pretty simple idea, just really important, and and we're, we don't even when we remind ourselves we don't do too well at it. Well, that's funny. It's funny to me because we hear these sayings all the time. People say them all the time, but I wonder if they're almost sort of um, superficial in a sense that it's like when you say look at the big picture. I mean, you kind of know what you mean, like zoom mm -hmm. out, but we don't really know that. We don't usually do that. So we've created this saying to be, remind ourselves, hey, go up a level, like mm -hmm. see something bigger than what you're talking about, meaning you're being too small minded or too narrow in your focus. Right. But I don't know that people would automatically connect that to a statistical weakness in their thinking. Yes. That they don't absolutely. know that necessarily. And that's why I love part whole that, you know, because part whole is this really dynamical relationship and it's also cluing you into every part is a whole and every whole is a part. So you have the part whole relationship, but you also have every whole is a part mm -hmm. and every part is a whole. And then you have this algorithm for fractals, right? Right, which is that you can see the whole universe kind of in this fractal way. So no matter where you are, you know, like you can think bigger picture. Well, bigger picture from me is family, you know, town, society, state, you know, society, you know, country, society, whatever, you know, that's bigger picture. But what if your bigger picture from, from, you know, one little square inch on a tree? Right. You know, what if your bigger picture from an atom? What if your bigger picture from a molecule? What if your bigger picture from, uh, from, you know, uh, an organism? Yeah. There's bigger pictures all Everywhere. the way up and there's littler pictures all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. From, you know, 10 to the minus 32 to 10 to the 27th or something such like that. Nerd. Just a huge, huge numbers. <laughs> You're such a nerd sometimes. I'm <laughs> sorry. I like it. I like it. But I mean, that's the scale of the universe I from understand. strings, <laughs> strings to, you know, metaverses. Yeah. And I think I think in a in an interesting twist of fate, we maybe have come up with these sayings to sort of remind ourselves of things that we don't tend to do. I mean, you think about things like um, you are the weakest link, right? Yeah. A chain has its weakest link. Yeah. Or My football coach used to say that all the time. Oh, no. I hope he wasn't saying it to you. No, no, not to me. <laughs> no. No. Well, sometimes I think he probably said it to me. But 
No, it was, uh, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link, obviously. That's kind of a team, a team saying, which is a relationship, a systemic relationship issue, right? Like you say, you've got this strong chain and you've got all these strong bonds, mm -hmm. but inevitably, if you look at the chain as a system, then really what's the most important is that you have some some level of quality of all the links that you, you can't have all these strong links and one weak link or the chain is essentially worthless. Right, and that even though the chain is made up of many, many parts, yeah. it's, the, it's the strength of the connections or the links that yes. make the difference, yeah, exactly. right? Which I think is true of a lot of things that we think about. Absolutely. Right? When we think about things like, um, a friend of mine said mm -hmm. the other day, oh, a rising, a rising tide lifts all boats. Right. Yes. So, like, there's a connection there. Yeah. And and I think a lot of times we fail to see the the importance of the connection. We focus on the things rather than. A hundred percent. You know hundo the connections, P. but hundo p. That's the new thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so why why do we why do we focus so much on the stuff rather than on the way that stuff's connected? I think it's because we see the stuff and we don't see the relationships, mm -hmm. right? And we're very visually oriented. Our cortex and all that is we're very we're very visual organisms, right? Yeah. Um, and and that's a powerful way that we perceive things is through vision. And unfortunately, relationships are not tangibly visualized in nature very often. We don't see them very often, right? You know how, how do you how do you visualize a relationship? Actually, a uh, great great uh, designer Edward Tufte, mm -hmm. at one of his books, he's he's trying to visualize a relationship, and he's got this blurry kind of picture of a dog jumping into a lake with the splash, right? Oh, yeah. So he's trying to visualize the dynamical thing that's happening. It's actually hard to see relationships, literally see, not see right. with the mind's eye, but and so. Because of that, we we tend not to see the interconnectedness of things. We tend not to connect the dots. This is another oh yeah, connect the dots. Another euphemism for you know we are, we have to connect the dots. We tend not to see the web of causalities. Mm -hmm. We tend to see you know this thing causes this thing, which is a very limited way to see causality. So I think we should stand stop on connect the dots for a minute. No good. Yeah, that's because a very popular saying. It's a very popular saying about a lot of stuff that really matters. Yeah. Like the connection between, I mean, big stuff like polarization and, you know, the health of our society between lobbyists and the healthcare industry and mental health. Like, I mean, I, I've heard it a lot in the last few weeks, I would say, you know, on the news and in podcasts and things people are like well we see all these things but we're not connecting the dots yeah right it's huge it's like these sayings are all trying to remind us hey pay attention to how things are connected because if we don't we're not really seeing the reality of how they are yeah so for example the moves that we've talked about again on the podcast and then we our trainings are all about the part party move is literally connect the dots that's what it does that's why it's a powerful move so you're you're literally sort of saying how are the parts connected how mm -hmm. are they interconnected mm -hmm. and and if we don't do that then we we won't understand systems i mean it's it's right. that simple you just won't understand the system if you don't understand how it's connected and not connected yeah and and so part party, and then the next move, the RDS barbell, mm -hmm. which is zooming in, relationship zooming, essentially. Zooming in not just to the things, but zooming into the relationships. Yeah. Um, and looking at the parts of the relationship. That is, that those two moves together give you everything you need to know about the interconnectedness and yeah. the dynamics of a system. Yeah. Right. So you first you got to see the connections, see how things are the dots are connected, and then you've got to zoom into those relationships, those connections, yeah. and see what's inside of them. Because what's inside of them is that's where all the action is in a system is yeah. in the relationships. Yeah. Not all the action, but a lot of the action. Well, yeah, and I mean the the most recent example or a really an example that most of us can relate to is we're always thinking about the relationship between our nutrition, our our exercise or our movement, and our sleep. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So people say if you want to be healthy, mm-hmm. if you want to lose weight or just, you know, Longevity. have more energy, that it's some people will say it's it's about what you eat. And some people will say, well, it's about whether or not you're moving every day or mm-hmm. exercising. And some people will say, oh, let's just get more sleep. But the truth is those three things have such a connection to each other that if you're not paying attention to how they're related, you're mm-hmm. not actually going to crack the problem or the you know, solve the problem. Yeah, and I think we're doing this all the time. We're constantly isolating things and creating these either or options. And and it's inevitably in science, if you look at the history of science, every either or option that we've argued, every false choice that yeah. we've been given, um, you know, it turns out inevitably to be both and both. You know, is it nur- nature or nurture? Well, it's both. Right. It, you know, is it behaviorism or cognitivism? Well, it's both, you know. So it's, it's uh, you know, is it positive or, or you know, r- realistic kind of psychologies? Well, it's both, you know, you need a little bit of realism in there. And you know, also there's tremendous benefit in being in positive psychology, right? So um, it's both. And, and we need to be able to take these different things mm-hmm. and connect the dots. Yeah. And and in my own kind of longevity and health journey that I've been on, uh, I've I've really spent uh, a long time trying to sift through all the morass and all that because, you know, there's so much BS out there that you have to sift through. There's just tremendous misinformation. And I've been able to to zero in on about 12 things. I call them the 12 gets. That's right. All interconnected. So it's not just those three things. Those are three of the yeah. 12. Yeah. But according to research and, and based on what I've been able to produce from the from the different people that are researching all these different areas, these 12 gets are really important. I think about these last two sayings about like reminding us to make the connections. But then there's also things like the butterfly effect and six degrees of separation where people think everything is connected. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure if I'm understanding those things quite right. Yeah, know. so six degrees of separation is just the the connectivity of networks, to right? Kevin so Bacon. it's yeah, it's the Kevin Bacon <laughs> rule. So that's uh, that's again how networks are cr- how how they're connected, mm-hmm. and how many jumps it takes to get from any person to another person in that network, mm-hmm. and um, it's also called the small worlds problem. Uh, so that's again, it's about how networks are connected and how we can create in in big networks how we can create the feel of small worlds, right? So in a in a world as big as eight billion people, it's kind of hard to imagine that it's such a small world that every person is connected just by six hops. Yeah. But so, somewhere in that vicinity it tends to, is 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 the truth. So that's what we mean by a small world. It's like the the mm-hmm. way that the um, these long bonds cause the network to have different dynamics and cause a big world to seem c- relatively small, um, like the Kevin Bacon effect. And and then the butterfly effect is a little bit different. That, that has to more, more to do um, with, with uh, chaos and what's called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And that just means yes. that this, the way that a system sort of evolves can be super highly sensitive on the very tiny Right. Tiny changes in the way that the system started. But people always say if a butterfly sneezes somewhere, then there's going to be like a tsunami somewhere. Like they, they say these it's things. It's not that there's going to be. It's that something something that small as the original thing yeah. could lead to something that large. Right. Interesting. That, so it's, yeah. it's just sending, it's, it's saying that the the initial conditions, the, the way a system starts could be a fraction of a micron off and you know so this this system is going to start here and this system is going to start yeah. here those two systems could end up dramatically in different places mm-hmm. at the macro level just from this very diff- this tiny little difference right on where they start so it's kind of getting at very small things at the original condition could lead to very big differences this episode is sponsored by training camp the ultimate online spot for building the mental fitness that drives personal and professional change and success. At Training Camp, 
you'll have access to the science and practice of thinking with personalized thinking assessments, tiered training, and best of all, practice that improves skill. Go to cabrerlab.org to learn more. And now, back to the episode. Somebody said to me, somebody said to me the other day, um, oh, you're just splitting hairs. <laughs> also, there's things like you got to draw the line, right? Mm -hmm. What's the, what, where's the, ba like, I have to protect the boundaries, my yeah. boundaries. And those all things are related to distinctions. Distinctions, yeah. Right? And, and making sure that there's a, a clear um, differentiation between one thing and another. Yeah. I think sometimes people say those things um, when actually the boundary isn't clear. Right. Right. So they're like, oh, well, you got to really draw the line. You got to find the boundary because whatever's happening in that conversation is um, muddled. Right. Or the, or the fuzziness of a boundary. Yeah. So, so statements like splitting hairs, for example, I mean, they're all, like you said, they're all identity, other distinctions, right? Yeah. But, but what that kind of statement is getting at is, is, is what is appropriate for the situation? What level of distinction making is appropriate for the situation? Right. Right. So it actually has a little bit of perspective. So if, if you're accused of splitting hairs mm -hmm. as a, as a saying, which I'm not, okay. right. But I mean, if you were, then, <laughs> yeah. then what that, what that, what's being said is for this given situation from this pers perspective, in a sense, that level of distinction making is unnecessary. Yes. Right? Yes. Whereas yeah. in another situation, perhaps that level of distinction making would be necessary. And that's always a very difficult, um, ironically, boundary to figure out, which <laughs> is to what degree do I need to distinguish for the given challenge, problem, situation, system, whatever? You know, how, how fine grained do I have to get? And I'll often use the example of a machete or a scalpel. Yeah. All right. Sometimes you're at the very beginning of something and you're, you're kind of that machete level distinction making. Right. Because you're there's no trail. Yeah. You're 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 standing at a forest that's like this, you know, and that's machete. And you're just hacking away at it and you're trying to build a place where you can step. Mm hmm. Well, eventually that that becomes a trail and then maybe you're doing, you know, shovel level stuff and then pretty, you know, eventually you could get down to scalpel level stuff. But where people uh, use these kinds of sayings is is I'm using a scalpel in a jungle, mm -hmm. right? Or that's I'm right. using a machete in surgery. Yes. Yeah. You know, so, so those are fit the situation. That's, a, that's a distinction error if I'm using a machete in surgery or a scalpel in a, in a jungle. Yeah. So it's interesting, the whole machete versus scalpel thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I get a sense that a lot of these kinds of sayings that we have are are almost a subconscious sort of intuition that something's wrong with what we're doing or say, the way we're saying something in a conversation, right? It's like you're just splitting hairs means mm -hmm. you're just, you're really just going too far in a fine and a finer and a finer grain distinction than, than is necessary mm -hmm. for this conversation. And I hadn't thought about that before, actually, in terms of that particular saying. I just thought it was sort of almost sort of a, a defense mechanism in a conversation or Something yeah, like it's that. weird because uh, the splitting hairs, I think, is almost always kind of a pejorative expression, right? You're, you're saying yeah. something negative. Yeah. But, I mean, there could be a situation where you would say, hey, we really need to split some hairs here. Right, right? which means we need to think deeper yeah. about what we're actually doing. And sometimes, well, ironically, this is another hair euphemism, but um, it's, you know, we should go over this with a fine tooth comb. Oh. Right. So that's making, you know, making more distinctions, essentially making mm -hmm. distinctions out of distinctions, distinguishing even deeper down into the thing. Yeah. And you also refer to something in 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 those in that conversation, fine versus fine grain versus um, coarse, coarse grain. grain. Yeah. I wonder if we should talk about that a little bit more when you're talking about an identity other distinction, what is a fine grain distinction versus a coarse grain distinction? Yeah, I'm not and sure th this is used all is. the time in science. You're always trying to figure out the unit of analysis or something yeah. like that, and, and that requires coarse graining or fine graining or coarse or fine grain distinctions. 
it's always going to be situationally dependent, right? Mm -hmm. It's always going to be from what perspective are we coming from and, and what are we trying to solve yeah. and what are we trying to do? But I, I mean, the simplest way to think of it is if I go coarse grain, say I'm looking at a bunch of, uh, you know, apples and oranges and things like that, yeah. right? Uh, if I go coarse grain, I could go fruit. So we can go fruit level. Well, yeah. fruit is coarse, mm -hmm. right? Because lots of things fit under fruit. Right. Right? Yeah. But if I zero in, then I might say apples and oranges and bananas, and that's a finer grain. But then I could say, well, there's Macintosh and uh, honey crisp the honey and crisp Braeburn. And Braeburn and and, right? <laughs> right? And I'm sure there's a million kinds of oranges, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even that's kind of interesting, right? Like, I would imagine that I, I could be wrong on this. This would be an interesting study. And why is it that, that people probably know more fine grain apple varieties than orange varieties? Yes, but that might be because... And why is that? I think there are many more. I think many more types of apples because people have been able to take a quality of one apple and another and then just sort of genetically create. yeah but we could do the same with oranges so yeah. why is that you know why is it that we that we have so, that literally in our supermarkets we have 20 different yeah. kinds of apples and two and two of kinds of oranges you know i'm yeah. sure i'm quite certain that there's many kinds of oranges uh but yeah i probably. bet you if you pulled people on the street very few of them could could name you know 10 types of oranges. There's 400 varieties of oranges. 400? Of yeah. oranges? Mm -hmm. How many yeah. apples? 7,500. 7,500 <laughs> so types, types of apples and 400 types of oranges. That's crazy. But, you know, so that's an example that's of fine, fine graining, grain right? Like, you know, so, and I think what DSRP reminds you of is that's always true. That's always true. You mm. can always bet on that being true. That if you find somebody, like I guarantee you, if you find somebody who, whose job it is to make these kinds of pens, mm -hmm. that they have distinctions that you've never heard of before for what this edge is called yeah. and what the standards or the specs are for that, for the different types of liquid that go into the ink and the fiber that goes into the end of this tip. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they have distinctions for all that stuff. I don't know what they are, but I guarantee you, if you talk to somebody who's, whose job it is to design these, uh, you know. They know. They know. Yeah. So every single thing that you can think of has a fine grain world that's equivalent to 7,500 types of apples. apples. And then there's experts on one of those types. Yeah. Who's the world expert on one of those types of apples? And that person knows more about that and is making so many fine grain distinctions around that type of apple. And that is true about everything. I'm, and DSRP kind of yeah. predicts that being true and helps you realize that that's true. Which means you can always be looking for more yeah. if it's important if it's at that important. moment to yeah. look for more. Yeah. You can also, if it's, if it's, helpful you can go up the level to fruit yep you know because if the conversation is not really about different types of fruit but it's at the fruit level you can you can go totally. up there and, and stay at that level yeah in fact sometimes we'll say and when people are conflicting we we'll say go to the fruit level like go yeah. if you're conflicting at this level mm -hmm. try to go up up some number of levels until you no longer conflict and then yeah. and then you'll understand something about where the conflict lies Right. right, because somewhere, somewhere at some level change, you're conflicting. But then, if you go one level up from that that level, mm -hmm. you're no longer conflicting. Wouldn't that be amazing? So if, we always say, go go to the fruit level, which means find that place of commonality yeah. first, yep. and then drill down and figure out where the disagreement is. Yeah. And sometimes we think that we're disagreeing at the fruit level. Right. But we're actually disagreeing at a at a part of one fruit. Totally. You know, and that's why I think we miss each other so much in 100%. conversations. Most of the really the worst arguments happen, uh, I'm going to use a metaphor here, be, between like Gala and Braeburn apples. Right? Yeah. You know, they're just like, you're not a Gala. You're not a Braeburn. And you're like, you're both, dude, you're both apples, man. 
You're literally both apples. You just Can you just take it easy? You're making applesauce all over the place. That's what happens with apple wars. <laughs> So, you know, you're, you're, but, you know, you're, but was... th that's where the fights happen. The fights happen between people that are more alike, right? More alike than different. You can imagine a game of risk <laughs> of fruit wars. Fruit wars. And apples would just dominate yeah. because there's 7,500. Yeah, or like a whole Star Wars trilogy that, that is all about fruit. <laughs> Um, but what's really interesting yeah. uh, along these lines, splitting hairs, is when I think of an apple, I don't think of apples. I think of fiber. I see. That's wacky. Yeah, because when it, for me, when I eat, I eat a lot of protein, meats and things, and, and it, I need fiber to process those. Uh -huh. And so I often feel like, oh, I need an apple or, you know, popcorn or something yes. as, as fiber. So I, I don't even think of those. That's like... Fruit level, right? I'm going up to like, these are just yeah. like how your body kind of interacts with these things. You're at like the nutrient nutrient level kind yeah. of level. So that's it's that's a form of distinction making that's kind of machete level or whatever. That's really interesting. So yeah. that was a perspective that you were taking on apples, yeah. which is fiber content. Yes. Well, not just fiber content, but their relationship to processing protein and other mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So there you have. I told you. Nutrition, exercise, sleep, yeah. the three biggest things that we need well, to do. Well, there's 12. But three out of 12. Those are three really, those are those three of the 12, yeah, of the 12 things that you need to get more of. The only other ones that I have sort of a little uh, curiosity about are things like... Ones meaning sayings? Sayings, yeah, yeah back to saying. I know we're, saying. We we're doing popular the, sayings. Just so, in case you forgot, because yeah. we've gone all over the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, which is fine, that's how it is, um, is things like... Think outside the box. Yeah. Well, people say that all the time. That's a distinction thing, right? You're just expanding the the you're just expanding the domain, basically. You're you're expanding where the boundary is. Yeah. Right. So thinking outside the box is just sort of saying like, there's a box. That's mm -hmm. the boundary that we've been stuck inside of, and we're just going to make a bigger box, essentially, or think outside the box you have to see more than that box so you have to take maybe even a different perspective like yeah. you took a different perspective on apple so you're kind of thinking outside of the box about apples because you're thinking about it from the perspective of fiber absolutely yeah i mean anytime we're changing distinctions we're shifting perspectives i mean that's the, the that's why these things are so dynamic in the human mind mm -hmm. is that you're you're not just changing a distinction you're not and that goes back to our you know the episode that we did on buckets oh yeah but you know it's you're not you're not just changing a distinction. You're changing a relationship, and the distinction changes. Mm -hmm. You're changing a perspective, which cascades into a, a shift in your distinction making. So these things are massively dynamic. Mm -hmm. So thinking outside the box requires both a perspective shift, a distinction shift, you know, that type of thing, and and it creates a part whole because now you have a outside, and then that contains the box. One of the ones that my mother used to say to me a lot that really stuck, and I think it, it impacted me quite a bit, was um, she would say, walk a mile in that guy's shoes or put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. She would say little things like that. Like, or she'd say, imagine what it's like to be Johnny. You know. So she was always trying to sort What was of, wrong with Johnny? <laughs> sometimes Johnny didn't have friends or oh, Johnny did yeah. something bad. And Johnny's just a regular... Johnny is just a... Just a he's like Bob. Yeah. It's Bob. just a name I made up. Uh, but, you know, there's always somebody that sort of, for yeah. some reason, has, has upset you or caused a problem. And you're like, well, take their perspective for a minute. So you can have empathy or you can understand the situation a little differently. Um, and it was, it was a, just sort of one of the biggest memories of my childhood. She would say those kinds of things. So much so that at one point when I was about, this might be too random, but I must have been six or seven, I stepped on an ant hill mm. by mistake. Mm -hmm. And for a minute I thought about all those little ants getting crushed yeah. by my foot. And I literally started to cry. And she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I just crushed, you know, I was like crying. I said, I can imagine, like, I didn't mean to, but I felt terrible because I could yeah, imagine you, like you feel I actually them. crushed those little They're ants, little home. and I felt terrible. Yeah, That's the kids were saying that the other day. They were because the wasps were coming in because of the cold. Oh yeah. And they were like trying to kill the wasps. I and know. And I said, "You don't have to kill the wasps. They're not bugging you." And they're like, "We they're in danger, whatever." 
I but, said, if it's not bugging you, you don't have to kill it. Like, it has a life, and it's trying to just yeah. do its thing. Just leave it alone. No, and you literally said they're just trying to get warm. They're just trying to, like, like, imagine yeah, what exactly. it's like to be cold, and exactly. all of a sudden there's a way to come into a place that's warm. Like, they're up there. Yeah, I'm not against, like, if a wasp is trying to, whatever, you know. Sometimes, you, sometimes wasps get hurt, but... I'm saying, you know, if you don't have to, you, you take its perspective and you're like, it's just yeah. it's just chilling. Oh, or the other one is there's two sides to every story. Yeah, that's a great we one. We say that a lot. Yeah, these are all obviously point view, point and view perspective mm -hmm. sayings that remind us to do that, to have whether we're, we're trying to build analytical perspective or whether we're trying to build empathy or compassion. All of that starts with perspective taking and understanding the point and the view is critically important. Understanding that the perspectives have these two variables, a point and a view, is yeah. really important. Partially because if you think of it this way, like you take Johnny's point of view. Well, how do you know, how, how do you get clear on whether you're taking Johnny's point of view on, right? So what is Johnny looking at? What is Johnny seeing? Mm -hmm. And what is, where is he coming from? That's the view and the point. But how do you know that you're not, you know, it's not your point of view on Johnny's point of view? Right. So I'm not actually being Johnny. You're not actually I'm being Johnny. me taking perspective on yes. Johnny. So it's like a second order thing almost. It it's is. But if you understand that there's a point and a view, then you understand that, that you're a point and Johnny and his view are your view. Yes. And that Johnny's a point and he has a view. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is, even though it's impossible to get out of your your literal point of view, right? You can't yeah, yeah. you can't escape the fact that you have a point of view. But what you're trying to do is not project your point of view onto Johnny's point of view. You're trying right. to really deeply understand this thing. Yeah. And so, you know, if you don't understand that a perspective is made of a point and a view, that's very difficult to make those kind of more sophisticated differentiations yeah. of am I seeing what I want to see about the enemy or about Johnny or whatever, right? I mean, we, we talk a lot to military folks all the time and, yeah. you know, it's very important that they see what the enemy is seeing, not what they see the enemy is seeing. Right. Right. Meaning they actually get into that. They actually that get into the, and, into yeah. that viewpoint. What's interesting to me about all of those sayings is they're reminding, and in, you know, my mother, reminding you that you're not the only person on this planet. Yeah, that's There are more thing. perspectives than yours. Couple. Or more points than yours, right? Yeah. And so yeah. all of those sayings are like, hey, remember, you know, it, the world isn't just what you see. There's other people looking at the same things, and that's where, you know, the rem it's a reminder. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, I, you know, I, I love Iceland, and I've been to Iceland mm -hmm. a number of times, and they have all these stories. I can't, I won't remember all the stories that they have, but they have these, like, these fairy, uh, uh, what do they call them, like, kid stories. They're like fairy tales. They're fairy fables. Tales. Fables. Fables, yeah. yeah. And they're all terrible. They're like, if they're you, scary. if you, they're scary, right? Yeah. If you go outside, something's going to eat you, and... And they're all, they were all designed to be kind of scary because, because if a kid left the home at night, the parents wanted that kid to be afraid to do that because, you know, they could go outside, get lost in the, in the fleeting, sleeting snow, and then, you know, they freeze to death in the old days. And um, so it, these remind me of kind of those stories like these these are sayings that are trying to teach us things that are mm -hmm. incredibly important and they're the reason that they're sayings that have been around for so long is because they're never not important they've always been important you know and yeah. in some ways we forget their importance right because they're just part of everyday language yeah exactly and we, don't and we really forget what they mean yeah. we don't think about them when we go oh we got to connect the dots yeah we got to we got to part party the dogs and dots and rds them mm -hmm. and zoom into those relationships and see what they're made of and we've got to connect all the things together so that we can understand the system and understand that this is not a linear causality. These systems are not based on linear causes. They're based on a webs of causality. Yeah. Right? And so sure. we're never going to really understand this outcome that we don't like if we don't understand all the webs of causality that go into it. And that has to do with all these things we're talking about, taking perspective, making the right 
fine grain or coarse grain distinctions. Yep. Connecting the dots, zooming into the connection, zooming yeah. into the dots, yeah. you know, like yeah. zooming out, zooming in. <laughs> it's very simple stuff, but it's stuff that we don't do a lot. Well, I think what's interesting. Our research has shown that we don't do it a lot. What I think is interesting yeah. is we always tell people, see it everywhere. And now I'm, I think we should mend that to say, when you say it or you hear it, pay attention. What is behind yeah. See the bigger picture. What does it mean you're splitting hairs? Make the connection between the saying yeah. and the sort of, um, I don't want to say weakness. The, the thing, need. The need yeah. to just extend your understanding a little bit differently. Yeah. Right? When I say walk in another person's shoes, I'm telling you, hey, maybe you need to take a different perspective on that. Absolutely. Something like that. I mean, I, I think we can train ourselves to actually connect Connect no. Connect the dots between the saying and what its underlying meaning is in terms that's, of our That's thinking. the training that that we do yeah. every day. You know that 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 training of the mind is so critical, mm -hmm. because if you train yourself to connect the dots, you won't have to remind yourself to connect the dots. You'll just connect them. You'll be connecting them. Yeah. Um, if you train yourself to take perspective, you won't have to remind yourself. You know. All the things that superstars do in games and, you know, on the battlefield and on the playing field and all these things, they do it because they practice them. Yes. They don't have to remember to dribble the way they dribble or, you know, shoot the way they shoot or, you know, use the strategy the way they use the strategy. They, they do it because they practice them. So it's really important to practice these things, not just say these things. Yes. Right? Yeah, Don't just better. say connect the dots. Practice yeah. connecting the dots. Get good at it. See, you said that better than I did. <laughs> I don't think so. I thought you said it really well. I think we've done it. Oh, yeah? Is that it? Yeah, I mean... There's a lot of sayings out there. There are a lot of sayings, but I I was thinking about ones that I really hear a lot. Yeah. And that people say all the time. Well, the other one people talk about all the time is silos, you know, and like you know, silos are... are uh, silification you know that's a that's just the okay. lack of connecting the dots right so if we don't connect the dots yeah in real life we get silos that's right yes. there's lots of them lots of sayings that oh. that all have to do with thinking more systemically um and about systems because that's what's out there systems yeah but i like the idea of using the sayings as a way to guide your own practice if you hear somebody say one of these, ask yourself, what's really the meaning behind that? Yeah. And what are the absolutely. things that I could practice to really actually connect the dots? What are the things I could practice to walk in somebody's shoes? You know, how would I make a finer grain distinction about this thing that I'm talking about right now? Those kinds of questions. If you ask yourself those questions and you actually practice, you'll get better. I'm no P. All right. I think we've done it. That's a wrap. <laughs>